Hello everybody, my name is Eric and today we're going to do a basic intro to reverse engineering and cracking. First of all, a disclaimer. Cracking commercial software is illegal. This is a crack me, which is essentially a digital puzzle that is designed to be played in the same way that you crack software. So what I am doing here is entirely legal. Just need to get that out of the way. So what exactly are we going to do? Well, this is a crack me that is fairly popular and I like it. Uh, because it's got quite a cool uh, algorithm to it, but we'll work through that in a second. So, what do we have? We have to put in a username. Okay. So if we do that... Nope, that's not it. Try again. So, how do we deal with this? As an aside on the subject of comparing reverse engineering tools, I just thought I would show a cool site called Dogbolt. It is a decompiler explorer. And what we can do is we can upload a binary to this, and we can see how different reverse engineering tools, including Binary Ninja, Ghidra, and Hexrays, which is the one for Ida Pro, which is the other commercial reverse engineering toolkit. I, I didn't mention it initially because it's extremely expensive, and we can actually see. So how do all of these work? So we can see Binary Ninja handles it beautifully, recovering all of the types. Ghidra doesn't, as far as I can tell, uh, that function is pretty much lost. And on Hexrays, let's see what they've done. And Hexrays dump is a bit different in that it shows the names, and it seems to generally be a bit better at naming the variables, but we can see approximately that we've got uh, pretty much the same decompilation result, and we've got the Ghidra didn't do this one well, but that's not a constant. I always recommend that whatever tool you're using, always have Ghidra as it's free installed, and if you get bad decompilation from one tool, uh, trying it in a different tool can sometimes be helpful. Well, uh, depending on it, so first of all, I'll show you how to crack it, and then we can look at doing some more advanced stuff like a keygen. So there are a few tools you can use. You can either use a debugger, or you can use some sort of reverse engineering static software. I, I like Binary Ninja, I also have Ghidra. And for whatever reason, the author put a comment in this file that makes it totally break Ghidra. So we're going to use Binary Ninja. This is, uh, you can use the free version. I have the paid version, but I on the VM I use the free version because I don't want malware stealing my credentials. This this is the little thing that uh, Ghidra doesn't like. Most uh, message from the author. So we can see a couple of things. And of course here we can just scroll down. But not all software is going to look like that. So what I usually will do, and I, I really like how in, oh, we should do it from the decompiler one, how you can just search for text, which can be either code or strings, and it will find it for you. So, what do we want? Well, so, we can see this bad boy header and this. So let's try and find that. And here we go. So we've now found the first uh, fail condition. So we can see that what is happening here is if the return from this is greater than 3, or less than 3, obviously, and to be 0 padded, our username must have at least four characters, and that's where that comes from. So we're now in the function that does both the GUI and the checking. So here we can see one interesting thing. This, this is a strange uh, string, and we can see that this is being copied into this variable. Now, the data underscore in binary ninja is global variables, which means they can be accessed from different functions. Now, one of the things you do when reverse engineering is it's helpful to hit N so that you can rename, this is G on Ghidra, this variable. So we know this is some sort of, or ptext we'll call it, because this is related, ptext len, we'll call this one because it's the length. I'm going to assume this is the length of the user input. So then knowing that, uh, this is probably uh, user uh, user entered password. Now, coming down here, now this is tricky to read, and I, it would take me a while to figure out what this is doing. But we, we, what we can immediately figure out is that it doesn't look like there's a constant. It, do, it doesn't look like there's something here being immediately uh, checked. So, how does this work? Well, now we can try a couple of things. Now, first of all, as we get into binary patching, I'm just going to show you, and you can, every tool pretty much has a different way of doing this. Uh, you can either do the assemble, and in some of these, there's actually a nice user-friendly option where you can actually just 
go and do a patch, um, you can go either always branch or never branch or invert branch, which is uh, quite convenient. But the manual way of doing it that every tool has is straightforward enough. So first we'll want to be sure we've got the right one. So that is in fact what we want to do. So if we simply hit E to edit this, or right click and hit assemble, and replace the jump if not equal with a jump if equal, there we go. Now we can save this, and we're going to save this as a different name so that we don't overwrite our original. Cracked me.exe, we'll call this one. And we can try this one. Now it's still going to have the username requirement, but there you go. Now it tells us to write a keygen. Okay. But we cheated, because we still don't know what the right code would have been. But there is a way of figuring that out. So first of all, I'm going to undo this patch so that we don't have that polluting our code. And now let's try the debugger. Let's open this up. And let's first of all look at the assembly so we know what we're actually where the comp where the comparison is. Now another trick I, is you can hit E and you can see the actual addresses. So let's get the address for this one and the address for this one so that we know where they are stored in memory. Because we know one of these is going to be one of those. So now we can set a breakpoint here. Do that on Binary Ninja by going to debugger toggle breakpoint. And then we go launch. And it's going to warn us because, of course, once you're launching a debugger, this is no longer static analysis. If this was malware, you've just ran malware. So we click yes. Now we have to start it. And now we can test this out. Okay, now we've hit a breakpoint. Now we know that whatever EDX uh, is our password that we put in. And if we display this like so, uh, we can actually see if we follow that memory address that we suspected was the password, uh, we can see something that looks interesting around here. So I'm going to turn this to hex so that we can actually see the raw data. And this is what we were actually after. So this, we'll just go back to the other, other view so that we can, this is now properly detected. And this is our serial key. And that can be, that's just being displayed different ways. So now, because we're in the debugger and we have our memory, uh, we can actually see what that is doing. So it's simply now comparing our password with our serial key. So uh, it's going to fail again, but I'm going to copy our serial key before we resume this. Of course, it's not going to let us do it. So now we have the same value on both. We have both on our p-text and our serial key. So if we scroll up, we can actually get an idea of how this algorithm is working. So we're taking this, and we would need to set we'd need to set a break somewhere up here. So we can we can take a look at that in a second. Uh, but there is also an easier way of making a keygen that I will I will show. Okay, so we can stop debugging as we now know how this is working. And I find sometimes on Binary Ninja we have to reanalyze after doing that for whatever reason. So how do we go about getting this? Given that in order to validate the key, it has to generate the key. Now this approach only works in one specific circumstance, which is a key generation algorithm which takes a username or an email address and generates a single possible valid key. Not every key gen algorithm works this way. In fact, a lot don't. But if you are dealing with an algorithm that works this way, what you can do is we can go on down to either of these error messages. And what we can do is, and we can see where the reference to nope, that's not it, try again is pulled in, this one. And we can simply replace that address with the address of the serial key. And as you'll watch in real time, when we hit enter to save this, now uh, we can see the LP text says serial key. So what do you think that will do? Well, we're going to save this as a file and find out. Keygenme.exe. So I'm going to open the original and I'm going to open the keygen. Now the keygen, of course, spits out the key. So, yep, it's the correct key. Well, we already did write a keygen. And thanks to debugging, Binary Ninja has figured out a bit more about how this seems to work. Now that we've got that one all figured out, let's try another just to show the difference in approaches to these types of problems. 
So we'll create a new tab and we'll drag this one in. And the first thing we should always do is run it just so we can get an idea of what it might be doing. So it just has an enter password prompt. So uh, we can just search and hmm? okay, we can try password on its own. Okay, here, here we go. So now we just need to figure out where is, uh, well, I, I don't even think I need to bother because I think I've already found the password, but let's just see if we're right. Correct. Okay, definitely simple. But this one is simply a case of a static password where there is a single possible outcome. So uh, we can either solve it by getting the password out of the binary or, of course, uh, we could uh, use the same trick we used before, where we can go over to assembly. Yep, this is the one. Just do an E and just, just delete one line. Oh, oh, that actually... Well, well, we'll see what happens. Sometimes, because of course, all of these relative addresses have to say the same, sometimes binary patching can get weird, but I have faith. Yep, that got weird. That's why there's other options, such as just using the invert branch option. It's also possible I made a typo that caused that mess. Now, any password except the correct one works, which is just kind of funny. We could also change it to a jump if we wanted to. Now, here's another one. Uh, this one does want us to write a, a key gen. Uh, now, of course, I can't run this one because it's a Linux binary and this is a Windows VM, uh, but we can get an idea of how it works. Now, this one comes with symbols, so we can actually see what each of the functions are named, which is going to make everyone's life easier. So check format, so we can see what check format does. The main thing that I noticed while going through this uh, was on the, the check format is not that important, but the is valid checksum is the main check, of course. So what are they doing here? Well, uh, once we converted these from hexadecimal to character, I always will hover over this and just see if anything looks like it makes sense. So we see, okay, that looks a, that looks like a seven. And that's a zero. Now, it doesn't take, uh, and then of course we see a mod function down here, uh, which is checking if var 1c is divisible by 7. So it doesn't take a lot of thinking to realize that this is probably, and of course background knowledge helps here as well, that this is probably doing what the Windows 95 keygen algorithm did. So I actually, I, I just ran it on the host, and that is in fact what it's doing. Okay, so something I missed uh, was that, in reality, while that does work for number literals, for actual letters, the conversion is a bit different, because it's going back and forth, uh, so that's why my keygen attempt didn't work. So what we actually have to do is generate the ASCII characters and then convert them. So... It's still not going to be terribly tricky, but I'll just get that done. So characters 41 to 59 allow us to get the uppercase English alphabet because it rejects some characters like punctuation. That's how you trigger the formatting error. Okay, and after paying a bit more attention and writing the script correctly with our newfound knowledge, uh, here's what we get. S S E L L. This is just a random output. Of course, we can run this a lot of times. And now this one was more complicated because we couldn't just reverse it. So we actually had to pay some attention to the logic and not get tripped up by the fact that while it is using the old divisible by seven trick, what they changed here was using the ordinal values of ASCII. It's just kind of a bit more of a bear to deal with, but ultimately, uh, there we go. And of course, we can make this work with any number. We can choose any number of these. I'm just using the method of if every digit is divisible by 7, then the sum of them will be divisible by 7, but there, there are other ways of making that happen. Now, because we're talking about key gens, one final thing I thought I should mention. Uh, now, of course, remember, I don't encourage uh, pirating commercial software, but people who are interested in this are probably going to think of this. So the main benefit of a key gen is that we can run whatever software we have generated the key for without any modification, and the keys are totally portable. 
The reality of modern software keygens is almost all of them are functionally not doing that. Because most modern software uses online activation. So how do you get a keygen? Well, depending on the way the software is written, there's roughly two ways of doing it. Either they completely patch the key validation, which should call the online server to do something else, and the keygen is just for theatrics, or there are a few programs that might have an offline activation method that might have been reverse engineered. But generally speaking, modern keygens are more for show than they are for generating keys, because no serious, uh, like, major commercial software is going to use an algorithm like this these days. So that is all for now. I hope you enjoyed the video. I hope you enjoyed seeing the different ways. I, I covered a couple of them within these crack me's. Either that there's just a password hidden in plain text, there is a, a key generator based on the username, and, or sometimes there's simply just a key algorithm. This is similar to how Windows 95 worked, except with the added character step to make everything just a bit trickier. So that's all for now. Please let me know if you'd like to see more reverse engineering content in the comments below. Bye!